Hi, this is Dr. Karen Becker, and today I have a very special guest, Dr. Isla Fishburn. Dr. Fishburn has a BS in zoology, a master's in biological science, and a PhD in conservation biology. She's passionate about creating coexistence between people and wildlife, and she has really extensive qualifications in the realm of animal behavior and conservation. It was Isla's desire to focus her research on carnivore ecology and conservation. Isla has worked with wolves, wolf hybrids, and domestic dogs for many years now, and she continues to have a passion for working with megafauna and bridging the gap between the animals and the people that they come in contact with. As such, Isla has established a commitment to canine conservation specifically. Isla wants the world to love animals, but in her realm, aim for people to, at first, bring conservation into their home by loving the animals that they live with. For Isla, this focus is dogs. Isla owns Kachina Canine Communication, where she is a holistic dog behaviorist. She applies her knowledge of animal behavior, zoology, ecology, and conservation by teaching people why these very subjects must be understood to better the life of their domestic canine. So welcome, Dr. Fishman. It's a pleasure to have you. Hi, Dr. Karen. It's lovely to be here. Thank you. So Dr. Fishburne, I know exactly who you are and what you do, but for the people that aren't familiar with you, tell us a little bit about what you do. Okay, well, I'm Dr. Isla Fishburne, as you very well know. I'm a holistic dog behaviorist. Um, so my focus, I work with dogs, I work, work with canines. My focus really is looking at the fundamental needs of dogs. Um, one of them really being safety. The fundamental need of any animal is to feel safe. Um, and I'm very focused on helping optimize the dog's well-being, maximize the dog's well-being potential, and with that, helping a dog align with its natural self. And I know that you have always loved all animals, and I know this about you, but I, you have some really um, specialized and really unique and exciting training. When you were a little girl, did you know that uh, you've always connected with dogs? Did you know that you wanted to pursue this for a lifelong career? How did that come about? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, I, I, like, as an adult, I'm probably quite crazy, but as a child, I was really, really crazy um, because I always wanted, I always asked for a wolf and a bear when I was really, really young. Um, and for some crazy reason, I always asked for a, a fireman's ladder as well. To this day, do not remember why, but I always wanted a wolf and a bear. Um, and then I became a little bit older um, when I kind of realized um, getting a wolf and a bear wasn't possible. Uh, not only because they don't live in, in my country, but also because in my crazy imagination, um, this wolf and bear had to be real, but small enough so that they lived inside my pocket. Um, so they could go all, all everywhere with me. They could go wherever I went. Um, got a little bit older and realized that was a bit mad, obviously not realistic at all. Um, and so, yeah, I've always had this like love for animals. I ended up getting a rabbit. Um, but I really, really, really wanted a dog. And it might be cliche, it might be controversial, it might be a bit sickening. Um, but wherever it came from, from from a very, very young age, I've, I've always had a fascination with American Indian culture, beliefs, traditions, music, all manner of different things. Um, and it was kind of, that's kind of what got me started. Always, always had this this connection, this fascination with animals. And that's kind of made me, what, what drew me on to, to do my zoology degree. So I did my BSc in zoology. And, and actually, I never really wanted to work with dogs. I always had in my in my life path that I was going to do carnivore conservation. I was going to become a carnivore ecologist and work with kind of big predators out, out in the wild. And it was only when an opportunity arose after, after my PhD in conservation biology, where I worked with wolves for three years, captive wolves, um, where I was starting to meet a lot of people that had dogs. And actually from that, I kind of realized that that conservation for me needs to begin with domestic animals. Um, all domestic animals, you know, we hear all the time about the heartache, the sadness, the emotional state of, of domestic livestock, but also, you know, that can stem to hamsters, to guinea pigs, or, or all animals, really. Um, and for me, it's, it's for dogs. You know, we need to conserve our dogs. Why? We mess around with their genes so much. We, we don't know what we're doing. Uh, we mess around with their diet. We need to conserve their diet. We need to conserve their behavior. So for me, conservation has to begin at home. And then hopefully once we've mastered that, we can really focus on, on conservation of our, our wild animals. Well, and I know that your, your initial focus, like you mentioned, was really uh, conservation biology in terms of yeah. uh, wild species. But then you, you, the calling in terms of the need, the, the public's need, pet owners' needs, uh, people have got serious behavior problems with their yeah. dogs. And so because you, because you have your expertise with wolves and because of the correlation between wolves and dogs, it probably was, I don't want to say a natural evolution, but you probably got a whole lot more questions about dogs than you did wolves from the general population. 
Yeah. Yeah. And so your approach to domestic dog behavior is different. And I love it. It's fresh and it's renewing, but it's <laughs> different for so many reasons. Tell us a little bit about when you when you get a call, uh, I'm sure most of the time it's for behavior problems. I, uh, every now and then you get that refreshing young dog that people just want to do it right. But most of the time you do have those calls where there's a problem. How is your approach different, Dr. Fishburn? Oh, oh that's a great question. Um, so first of all, I'm kind of, I don't want, you know, I'm not a guru or anything. It's, it's really, really hard. It's really mentally exhausting. And that's kind of what it should be, right? Because you're working with another species. Uh, you're working with a live animal. Um, so they are intricate. There is a complexity to them. Um, so for me, as a zoologist, you know, I'm yes, I, I am an accredited animal behaviorist now, but everything always goes back to zoology. What do I know about zoology? What do I know about nature? What do I know about how animals work? Um, and for me, I've kind of devised these, a list, really, of causes of behavior. Um, now, the first and foremost thing that I look at is, again, an animal wants to feel safe. So why is this, what is this animal trying to tell me? So I really try and listen to that animal from, from what I know from a behavioral point of view. I look at the different causes of behavior that include such a wealth of things, genetics, the mother, epigenetics, diet, disease, trauma, uh, the number of vaccinations that animals had, absolutely absolutely everything but then i kind of just take that zoological approach i look at ecology i look at i look at competition i look at natural diet i look at social interactions dogs can and are social group animals they form social groups and then we see how the, their behavioral cha their behaviors change really depend on how they interact with these other individuals as well and this is a huge huge concept a lot of people kind of just have one dog they don't really understand the such the importance and relevance of group composition and that's kind of my take on things all encompassing what i really focus on is emotion the emotional state of that animal because of course that's what drives behavior mm -hmm. yes and one of the several compelling things you mentioned when i met you at the natural dog conference you talked about feed, nourishing the pack differently. So you feed the more dominant animals in a pack differently than you would feed the subordinate yeah. animals. Really, I mean, just you, you mentioned so many really interesting things. You mentioned yeah. to me just behind stage, you were talking about the time of month that a puppy is born and when you raise a puppy, spring or fall or winter, that, you know, there's so many things that traditional behaviorists don't necessarily take into consideration when they're looking at the whole picture of how and why certain behaviors came about. Um, but on that vein of nutrition, you also gave a really compelling and very interesting lecture about the correlation between dog and wolf nutrition. So give me the 30 second pared down version of your viewpoints in terms of, uh, first of all, the role of nutrition when it comes to dog behavior, but then uh, what, what we can do to potentially enhance um, a dog's well-being, including their mental well-being through species appropriate nutrition. What's your take on that? Oh, great. So, I mean, I love, I love diet. And, you know, I'm a behaviorist. I'm not, well, I'm a zoologist that, that looks at behavior. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a nutritionist or, or I'm not a vet or anything like that. So I really just take a very natural holistic approach to diet. Um, but diet's so important. Diet's so important to understanding behavior. Uh, diet and, and disease are linked. Also diet and, and communication, how, how dogs communicate with each other through what they've eaten and how that's metabolized and how that comes through with a chemical, a chemical scent. Um, and, and for me, it's, you know, we are doing so much better than what we did even kind of last year, but there is so, so, so much left to learn, which is amazing because we have to, we have to learn and able to maximize our dog's well-being, and kind of that's my focus. So again, looking at our dog zoologically, um, from that zoological approach, you know, they are canines. Uh, and I, I know there's the whole debate of our dogs, um, are they omnivores? Are they carnivores? What type of carnivores are they? But when we look at carnivores anyway, like if you, if you look at pandas, pandas, now I could be wrong here, but I'm sure I'm right. Pandas are, are carnivores, but most of the diet is, is vegetation. So you have to kind of look at, okay, what, what animal you're referring to in the first place. Um, but for me, we see anatomic, anatomical um, similarities, taxonomic similarities between our dogs and, and our wolves. And um, first and foremost, we have the wolf known as Canis lupus. Our dogs are known as Canis lupus familiaris. For me, that means, okay, our dogs are classed as a subspecies. That means, okay, we've got some differences, which kind of domestication has obviously created, which I'll talk about to you in a moment. But they are still got so many similarities to them that, that that's kind of why they're kind of grouped in the same taxonomic grouping, uh, as, as it were. Anatomically, 
they've got canines. They have teeth that tell us they have to have, they are supposed to have meat. They're supposed to have bone. And, and there's a whole thing about, um, you know, raw food, raw food, raw food. But it's fresh food. Fresh food is so important for our dogs. And that's kind of, that's, that's really, really my focus for their health. Um, and, you know, we're learning all the time about what, what food is appropriate. And this is why I don't think we know, we, we really have got so much more to go. When we look at, at a wolf diet, again, people come to me all the time. They know that I work with captive wolves and they say to me, oh, a wolf does this, doesn't it, Isla? And I'm like, do you know what? It depends on what group you're looking at because we have individual differences all the time. Yes. We have individual differences in our dogs. We have individual group differences within our wolves. And this is what we have to look at. We have some wolf groups that will feed on, for example, moose and deer and wild boar we have other wolf groups that will just eat wild boar and um, so we have to look at why now for me uh, it's very very hard to do these days but for me i would always say actually our dogs need to have a wild prey diet and that is because there is so so many bad things going on to our domestic livestock there you know pump full of hormones pump full of antibiotics one of the biggest things that i really want to, to understand and look at more is let's say for example we have we have a cow and that cow was slaughtered at seven and put in for, for dog food production. Now, what happens if that cow's had seven years of neglect, seven years of, of a hellish life? That negative emotion, our dogs are going to feed on. And I guarantee that's going to affect the health of our dog. So it's things like this that, that we really need to focus on as well. Not just about the well-being of our dog, but the well-being of, of the prey animal that the dog's going to feed on. And for me, again, when we look at, at, at wolf groups and what wolves feed on, predominantly yes okay they do take some livestock that livestock tends to be taken when they're preferred prey so wolves have a preferred prey and it's when that preferred prey that population density is, is really really low right. but the question is why are they taking this wild prey and and why is it so much more healthier than than our domestic livestock now of course there are there are lots of answers for that um but for me that that is is, is a, a very very good focus um and also with that as well you know, wolves um, are very restricted in in their prey choice. So we we kind of say that wolves have a of a large a large diet breadth, but really they don't. They they kind of have maybe well some wolf groups just have one preferred prey animal. Some have one, two, or three. So that that prey source is kept really low. Now again, for our dogs, there's there's a whole lot of information, a whole lot of of conversation going on about we have to vary the the prey source for our dogs. So we get these different nutrients, which of course is massively important. But more studies need to be done actually in our wild canines, like our wolves, to find out, okay, well, well, what's going on with them? What's going on with them physiologically and health-wise if, if their diet is more restrictive? Now, that might be because simply they're having wild animals and the wild animals have just so much, are so much better in quality than what a lot of our, our prey animals are for our domestic dogs.